Welcome to the Ethel Brown Harvey postdoctoral seminar series. My name is Daniel Aldea, and I am a postdoc at the University of Pennsylvania. Today, I will moderate in, uh, this session with uh, Harini Iber, a postdoc at Stanford University. We are excited to highlight the work of our standing postdoctoral member. Today, Dana Shong from Washington University in St. Louis and Joseph Campanale from University of Can California, Santa Barbara, will share their research. Each speaker will give, e will give a 20 minute talk followed by 10 minutes of Q&A. Please enter your question in the Zoom Q&A box. Our first speaker is Dr. Dana Chong. She got her PhD in human genetics at the University of Utah with mentor, Dr. David Grunman. There, she studied uh, the role of Ryan Odin receptor in modulating receiving self response to sonic headcatch ligand. Then she moved uh, to the laboratory of Mesa Mokalet, Mokalet at Washington University in St. Louis. There she had been studying how the spinal cord recovered after injury inducing zebrafish as animal model. Dana has a quite remarkable record of publication and she has received, she has received several uh, uh, awards. Among her publication, I just would like to highlight that one of her PhD publication was selected as the best developmental uh, cell paper in, a, in 2018. Um, without further ado, Dana, uh, you can take it away. Dana, you are mute. There we go. Thank you so much for the introduction. And I'd like to thank everyone for attending today. Um, today, I'm excited to tell you about my work I've been doing in my postdoc, where I'm characterizing the immune response in the regenerating zebrafish spinal cord. So shown here is a spinal cord five days after a complete transection, where uh, the glia of the spinal cord are labeled in blue, and immune cells are labeled in green and magenta. And these are the cells that I'll be telling you about today. So uh, in mammals, there's a limited regenerative capacity to the central nervous system. So any damage to the spinal cord leads to the loss of uh, both sensory and motor function caudal to the site of lesion. And in a, a patient MRI, even decades after injury, we can still see a persistent scar present at the site of injury. However, in the zebrafish, uh, we actually have quite a different story. So one week after a complete spinal cord transection, the fish swim, but they're doing so using just movement rostral to the lesion. However, just a few weeks later, these same fish are swimming as if they were never injured. So one of the major goals of the McCallid lab is to better understand the mechanisms that allow for this spontaneous recovery. And specifically, I'm interested in how the zebrafish immune system supports spinal cord regeneration. So the effect of immune activation on the uh, outcomes of neural injury are quite heterogeneous, depending highly on a spatial and temporal context. Um, but uh, just generally, what we know from the literature, it, it's generally thought that acute immune events are absolutely important for uh, functional recovery. So this includes helping to heal the wound, clear debris to provide a permissive environment, and helping to prevent infection. However, if this immune activation persists into the chronic injury phase, since instead leads to uh, anti-regenerative outcomes. And this includes uh, secondary neuron loss, so loss of neurons that were not uh, damaged or uh, injured in the initial injury, lost barrier function, and uh, immune activation in the chronic phase is also uh, a kind of aids in this fibrotic response that I discussed in the previous slide. So it's really unclear what specific aspects of the immune system are beneficial to neural regeneration, but quite nicely for us, the immune system is conserved between zebrafish and mammals. So I can use the zebrafish as a model to better understand how the immune system can support spinal cord regeneration. So just like mammals, zebrafish have two arms to their immune system, an innate myeloid branch and an adaptive lymphoid branch, as well as CNS resident microglia. And so using this evolutionary conserved immune system, uh, I want to explore pro-regenerative uh, immune activation. And so not a lot of work has been done in the regenerating zebrafish spinal cord, specifically in the adult. So I started this project with a few basic questions. I first want to understand the composition of immune cells that are responding to injury, and then to explore if this immune response is actually required for regeneration. 
And then ultimately, I'd like to better understand the gene expression that's regulating uh, immune activity in the regenerating spinal. So first, um, to characterize cell composition, I started by performing histology for different immune cell subsets. And so throughout the course of my talk, I'll be showing predominantly cross sections of the spinal cord in the lesion site, unless I uh, note otherwise. And so here I'm showing histology for a pan-leukocyte marker called LCP1 or L-plastin. So this will label all cells of a hematopoietic lineage. And in the uninjured spinal cord, we do see some L-plastin positive cells. And these are the resident microglia. And shortly after injury in the lesion site, there's a robust accumulation of these L-plastin positive immune cells. These peak at three and five days post-injury, but by 14 and especially 28 days post-injury, these immune cells are effectively cleared and are returning back to baseline levels. So this suggests to us that immune activation following injury in zebrafish is transient and these cells are returning back to baseline. And so we can label um, for more specific subsets of immune cells and uh, redo or, or perform this analysis again. And so here I'm now showing L-plastin in magenta and I've overlaid MPEG-YFP, a transgene, um, in green. And so this transgene will label all microglia and macrophages. And we were surprised to find that at all levels of the spinal cord and all time points, that over 75% of these L-plastin positive leukocytes are in fact MPEG-YFP positive. So that suggests to us that the predominant immune cell responding after injury are in fact microglia and macrophages. And we've repeated this analysis using additional immune cell markers for neutrophils, macrophages specifically, and T cells. And taking all of this data together, we can actually plot this on a single graph. And um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, microglia and macrophages are the predominant immune cell. These cells peak at three and five days post-injury, but then return back to baseline levels. And so we do see an early infiltration of neutrophils and a late infiltration by T cells, but both of these contributions are minor compared to microglia and macrophages. So taking this data together, along with what we know from the literature in mammals, we do see some similarities between the immune response in the um, uh, zebrafish spinal cord after injury and the mammalian spinal cord after injury. However, there are, are some big differences between these responses. So perhaps uh, one response or, that's, or one difference is that the composition of these immune cells is quite different with neutrophils and lymphocytes playing a much smaller role in the zebrafish spinal cord. But perhaps the most important is that uh, this immune infiltration and activation is transient in zebrafish. And um, this immune activation is just never really cleared in the mammalian spinal cord after injury. So this suggests to us that the immune response in the regenerating zebrafish spinal cord is distinct from that of mammals. And so now that we have a better idea of the composition of immune cells responding to injury, we really wanna understand if this immune response is required for spinal cord regeneration. And so to interfere with immune signaling after injury, we took two independent approaches. The first was more broad using a steroid uh, dexamethasone. The second was more specific where we uh, genetically ablated these MPEG 1.1 expressing microglia and macrophages. We saw similar results with both approaches. So today I'll just be telling you about this genetic ablation. And so this system relies on a transgene where the MPEG 1.1 promoter is driving the nitro reductase enzyme. When I treat with the prodrug metronidazole, this will cell autonomously ablate all microglia and macrophages. And then to measure whether fish can functionally recover after a spinal cord injury, we perform a standard endurance swim assay. In this assay, fish are placed in a tunnel, they swim against increasing flow speed, and as a fish becomes exhausted, we remove them from the tunnel and record their swim time. So the more recovered the fish, the longer they remain in the tunnel and the longer their swim time. So using this endurance swim assay, we ablated microglia and macrophages with metronidazole treatment, and then swam fish at 14 and 28 days post-injury. And we found that these animals where their microglia and macrophages had been ablated actually exhibit poor functional recovery. That's shown here in teal compared to the controls in gray. So um, what we actually did is we ablated these cells for the first 14 days after injury, but we then removed metronidazole and allowed microglia and macrophages to recover to vehicle treated levels and swam the fish again at 28 days post-injury. 
And we were surprised to find that although the microglia and macrophages uh, uh, recover to vehicle treated levels, these fish do not regain any additional functional recovery. And so that suggests to us that the immune events in these first two weeks after injury are absolutely necessary for more downstream regenerative processes. So this was looking at a functional readout of, um, of spinal cord regeneration, but we also wanted to know if the spinal cord is anatomically recovering as well. And so for this um, experiment, we performed an anterior grade axon labeling assay. And here we place a dye in the rostral spinal cord. This will label all neurons, but only axons that bridge across the lesion and into the caudal spinal cord will be labeled with this assay. And they appear as little dots in the caudal spinal cord. And using this uh, axon regrowth assay, we did find that these microglia macrophage ablated animals do not have um, a very good axon regrowth across the lesion site, either at 14 and 28 days post-injury. So all of this consistent with what we saw with the functional readout, and this really does suggest that this early uh, MPEG cell response is necessary for functional and anatomical recovery after spinal cord injury. So now that we know this immune response is required for regeneration, we want to understand the gene expression that's regulating this pro-regenerative immune activation. And so uh, we wanted to better understand immune uh, specific genes that could be involved uh, in this process. And so as a first pass, I started with the data set that our lab has available. And this is bulk RNA-seq of the spinal cord at five days post-injury. After filtering this data set for a few quality filters, and for genes that are, uh, have an ID mammalian ortholog, this led to a list of 536 genes that are upregulated in the zebrafish spinal cord at this time point. I further filtered this list for genes that are involved within um, the immune and inflammation gene ontology terms, leading to a list of 162 genes that are immune related and upregulated at this time point. And then I further filtered for an additional step using a publicly available data set in, um, uh, after mouse spinal cord injury at five days post-injury. And I selected here for genes that are actually down-regulated in the mouse. And this led to a list of 48 putative pro-regenerative immune-related genes. And so we're um, analyzing the role of these 48 genes in the regenerating spinal cord. But today I'm gonna tell you about just one of these genes. And this gene had actually caught our attention because we've hit it in our lab before um, with multiple uh, independent screens. And this gene is called TCIM or transcription and immune response regulator. And we had originally hit this gene in a spatial expression screen where we were looking for genes that are upregulated in the regenerating spinal cord and display a very interesting spatial expression pattern. So here this gene TCIM is not expressed um, very strongly in the uh, uninjured spinal cord. However, it's upregulated at one week post-injury in this kind of scattered expression pattern. We were also further intrigued by this gene because there are links between TCIM and immune signaling uh, available in the literature. However, these studies did not really give us any insight into what TCIM is doing during regeneration. So quite nicely for us, TCIM is well conserved between zebrafish and mammals. Zebrafish actually have two copies. It's called uh, TCIMA and TCIMB. Both of these genes make a peptide of 100 or 101 amino acids. Uh, and this um, peptide has no known or characterized domains. However, when we align the peptide sequence between both zebrafish genes along with human, chimpanzee, and mouse, we do see that TCIM peptide sequence is quite well conserved across species evolutionarily. So that suggests to us that at least at a molecular level, whatever TCIM is doing in the fish, it's likely also doing in the mouse. So we first wanted to explore what cells are expressing TCIM after injury in the zebrafish. And here we performed HCR in situ hybridization. And I'm showing this uh, for both TCIM A and B in magenta in longitudinal sections where I've stained for panleukocytes in blue and microglia and macrophages in green. In the uninjured spinal cord, there's not very much expression of either gene. However, at five days post-injury, we see this robust upregulation of both TCIMA and B. And if we zoom in on just a few microglia, we can actually see that TCIMA is strongly expressed uh, and localized to microglia and macrophages. While TCIMB shows a similar pattern, we can also find genes outside of MPEG YFP positive cells or sorry, we can also find expression in uh, outside of MPEG-YFP cells as well. 
And so this told us that GCIM is actually upregulated after injury and is localized to microglia and macrophages. And so that begs the question, is TCIM actually regulating spinal cord regeneration? And so to first answer this question, we took a loss of function approach where we generated um, uh, loss of function mutants of both TCIM A and B. These mutants lack the entire coding sequence of the gene. And then I generated single and double mutants and swam these fish at uh, 14, 28, and 42 days post-injury. So compared to controls in black and gray, um, our TCIM single mutants in magenta and blue do have a functional recovery defect. However, our double mutant shown here in teal actually has the strongest functional recovery defect. So that told us that TCIM is necessary for a functional recovery and that this double mutant has the strongest phenotype. For that reason, in uh, downstream analyses, we chose to use the double mutant. So we know that TCIM is necessary for spinal cord regeneration, but we also wanted to test sufficiency. And so for this experiment, we actually uh, generated a novel transgene where the heat shock promoter is driving human TCIM. And so this transgene will overexpress uh, human TCIM in response to heat shock. In these animals, we perform spinal cord injury and then daily heat shocks and swim the fish at 14, 28, and 42 days post-injury. So compared to controls in gray, our TCIM overexpressing fish in teal do in fact have accelerated functional recovery, suggesting that human TCIM is sufficient to enhance functional recovery. But unfortunately, both of these analyses were actually looking at um, a kind of whole body genetic uh, manipulation, and we didn't have any cell type specificity. So this is a stable mutant line, and we have no spatial control over the overexpression of human TCIM using this promoter. So for this reason, as a first pass, we next chose to combine the uh, TCIM overexpression transgene along with our microglia macrophage ablation line. And so we can then ablate microglia and macrophages in this TCIM overexpressing background. I'll just remind you that compared to controls in gray, our, TC, or our uh, microglia and macrophage ablated fish shown here in magenta have um, poor functional recovery. However, if we just overexpress TCIM on its own, these animals have uh, um, enhanced functional recovery. However, if we combine the two transgenes, we actually lose this enhanced recovery in our TCIM overexpressing background. So that suggests to us that um, this overexpression uh, enhanced regeneration is actually requiring microglia and macrophages. And quite nicely, if we look at our axon regrowth assay, this agrees with the functional uh, recovery data as well. So this suggests that TCIM is regulating reg regeneration within microglia and macrophages. We can now add this to our model, but the next obvious question is, is TCIM actually regulating spinal cord regeneration through the activation of the immune system? So to begin testing this uh, possibility, I first performed histology for immune cells in our different um, wild type and TCM mutant backgrounds. And so compared to, uh, or I'll just remind you that in controls in wild type fish at five days post-injury, we have this transient in accumulation of immune cells that are predominantly microglia and macrophages. And these cells are clearing um, by 14 days post-injury. However, in our TCM mutants, we actually see quite a different story. So the, there is no change in the number of microglia and macrophages, but there's an increase in these non-microglia and macrophage um, MPEG negative leukocytes, suggesting an increase in these blood-derived immune cells. And if we look later at 14 days post-injury, these cells are not clearing very effectively either. So this suggests that TCM mutants actually have a defect in the composition and clearance of immune cells. And this got us wondering if um, in these TCIM mutants, if important immune events post-injury are actually impacted as well. And as I mentioned in the introduction of my talk, one of the most important functions early on um, for leukocytes is to actually help clear debris from the lesion site to provide a permissive environment for axon regrowth. So they do this predominantly through phagocytosine debris from degenerating and dying cells. And the phagocytic capacity of leukocytes is um, tightly controlled by their activation state. So we wanted to test if um, there's a, a change in the amount of cellular debris in our different TCIM backgrounds. And so as a proxy for uh, cellular debris, I next stained for MBP, which is a label, uh, which in the, in the lesion site at this time, but will actually label myelin debris from degenerating uh, neurons. And so in controls at 14 days post-injury, you'll see that there's very little myelin staining. And if we zoom in, 
um, on the thimerous reconstruction, you can see that that um, is quite true. However, in our TCIM mutant background, we actually see an increase in the amount of uh, myelin debris shown here in magenta and engulfed myelin in uh, cyan. So this suggests that um, uh, myelin debris or, or my fragments of myelin is actually increased in our TCIM mutant background. However, if we look in our TCIM overexpressing line, we actually see the complete opposite. So this is now looking at a much earlier time point where we can find myelin debris present in the lesion site of control, uh, control fish. However, in our TCIM overexpressing fish, it's actually quite difficult to find any myelin, either um, extracellular or engulfed within these L-plastin-positive leukocytes. So this suggests that um, TCIM is actually both necessary and sufficient for the engulfment of this myelin debris within the lesion site. And so in our model, we think that TCIM is regulating the phagocytic capacity of microglia and macrophages. We don't yet know if the, they're doing this through actually activating um, or, or regulating the, the phagocytic pathway or if it's through activating the um, activation state of these cells. But we're working to better understand mechanistically how TCIM is One doing. Minute. So just to summarize, um, I, I told you today about the cell composition uh, of immune cells responding to spinal cord injury. These cells are predominantly microglia and macrophages. This transient immune response is absolutely required for spinal cord regeneration. And I also told you about a gene called TCIM that is expressed by microglia and macrophages, and it appears to be regulating immune cell um, composition and the clearance of uh, uh, myelin debris in the lesion site. So in future directions, we're uh, working to explore the mechanism of TCIM action and uh, to really understand how TCIM is regulating microglia and macrophage phagocytosis. So I'd like to thank you so much for your time and attention. I'd like to thank all the members of the McCollid Lab, but specifically um, our mentor, Mason McCollid. Um, I showed um, uh, uh, the TCIM mutants were generated by a staff scientist in the lab, Brian McAdoo. And I've received a lot of help from Dr. Lily Zhu in um, uh, performing histology and just a lot of the, the training for um, these different techniques. I received zebrafish lines from the Roe Johnson Lab at the University of Utah and the Apple Lab at Colorado. I have a fantastic team of collaborators at WashU and um, fantastic core facilities. Um, I'd like to thank my funding sources as well as funding sources for the Macaulay Lab. And with that, I'd be happy to take your questions. Uh, that was a fantastic uh, presentation. Yeah. I, I really enjoyed your you. your work and, and and all the images and videos that you showed and your scientific work. So we have a uh, already we have um, several uh, questions like that coming in. Like uh, Malika, uh, she asked. Uh, in addition to clearance, uh, do you know if the MGMF uh, cells activate progenitor cells that would form their regenerated spinal cord? That's a really fantastic question. Um, so work actually from the Becker labs has shown this, that um, microglia and macrophages will actually come in and kind of uh, you know, contact neural progenitors to uh, trigger their proliferation. So we have done some measurement of this in the adult, looking at cell proliferation of neural progenitors. And I, I was a little surprised to find that when we ablate microglia and macrophages, we do see a subtle effect uh, a decrease in um, progenitor proliferation, but it was uh, quite a bit more minor than what we were expecting. Okay. Um, Kyle, Lou, um, ask, uh, uh, thanks for your presentation. It was really fantastic to hear about the influence of immune cells on regeneration. And I ask, uh, what signal do you think recruit these myelin uh, cells in, to the injury sites? That's a really good question. Um, so the short answer is we we don't yet know. Um, we definitely think that there are, are likely damage uh, associated molecular patterns that you know from these degenerating and dying cells that are recruiting immune cells. Um, and um, we also do see. So I, I kind of glazed over this, but neutrophils are responding very quickly. Um, so we think that they're likely uh, kind of reacting to some of these uh, damps to actually infiltrate in and then recruit these additional immune cells uh, to the lesion site. Great. Uh, actually, in addition, uh, as a follow-up uh, question, uh, um, are there signals that dispel myeloid cells from the injury site afterward 
in zebrafish, leading to only the transient recruitment of myelot cells in, to the injury? Uh, yeah, yeah, that's a really great question. Um, so I, I think that is a major question that I'm getting very excited about kind of using, exploring my future directions and hopefully building my future lab off of is a, it's very clear that there are just the, the, the um, immune activation between zebrafish and mammals is very different. And so, I mean, that, that really is the million dollar question. What are the genes and the molecular pathways that are driving this difference? You know, why are zebrafish able to kind of clear uh, immune activation so effectively? Um, so we do think there are genes uh, that are doing this. And we're using transcriptomic data sets, looking at kind of expression patterns. So, you know, genes that are, you know, peaking at different times to better understand these different phases of immune activation. Great. Um, yeah, Margot Williams uh, asked, uh, said, uh, amazing talk, Dana. Uh, can you speculate why clearance of cell deliveries promotes regeneration? Um, yeah, so I think, I don't necessarily think that the clearance of debris is actively promoting regeneration. I think it more has to do with the uh, the absence of the debris. It's so, the, you know, the you actually have to, you know, get these cells to come in. They provide this permissive environment, and then they need to clear so that way you don't lose additional neurons, so that the blood spinal cord barrier can close, and um, so that you know you don't get this fibrotic response. And so one of the the um, things that I would really like to test is if we can actually activate the immune system later, so kind of sustain uh, immune activation can we actually generate a fibrotic scar? So one of the things I haven't said yet is that the zebrafish, we've actually never seen any evidence of a fibrotic scar under normal circumstances. And so we're really wanting to deconstruct regeneration to actually cause some of these anti-regenerative events in the fish. Um, uh, Kristen, uh, I wanna... Uh, ask, uh, go say, great talk, Diana. Uh, can you tell if there are any difference in macrophage and microglia morphology, morphology in wild types versus TCM, TCIM double mutant? Yeah, that's a fantastic question as well. Um, so there definitely is a difference in morphology. Um, let me, me reread that question just to make sure I completely understand. So, Yes, so um, we do see the cells become much more amoeboid, like they look much more like foamy macrophages. So, uh, and you know, that would be more indicative of like a, a pro-inflammatory activated state. Um, I am building tools to better quantify this, um, you know, to do things like sparse labeling. And we're also doing some mammalian tissue culture work where we can actually um, like, do more live imaging and look at, get, you know, better metrics of cell morphology and um, kind of, you know, a better temporal resolution of kind of the, the various morphological changes after injury. But the short answer is yes. Um, the uh, microglia and macrophages and the TCM mutant background do look much more pro-inflammatory in, in terms of their morphology. Let's see. Uh, actually, we have a little bit of time, so I think I'll go ahead. I have a couple of questions as well. <laughs> okay. uh, I don't see more questions coming in right now. So um, in your arena um data uh, when that you show, uh, did you see any like pathway that was like a downregulated, uh, a part of cover of the immune cells that you observed and that you follow up and I don't know, angiogenesis or I don't know, it just gets in yeah. that we yeah. That's a really good question. Um, so yes, we actually do see differences in, in angiogenesis after injury. Um, and I, you know, back when I first started this project, uh, the, this bulk RNA-seq data set was what we were working with at the time. But since then, actually a, a really fantastic postdoc, postdoc in our lab, Vishnu Saraswathi, he has started performing single cell analyses, looking at um, specific pathways uh, in, in specific cell subsets. And one of the most powerful tools we've had thus far is actually using cross-species comparison, where we look at pathways that are, you know, moving in one direction in the mouse and the other direction in the fish. And this has been really informative, um, kind of cluing us in on important cell populations that are species-specific and looking at species-specific pathways. So I think um, uh, there's a lot of things to do in our yeah. lab right now. 
Yeah, yeah, ongoing work. yeah, and uh, I last and like I guess quick question. We are almost uh, done. Like uh, I guess that you see uh, any difference, like depending on the age of the zebra fish when you like uh, within here. I guess you get the, that question a lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so I actually haven't specifically looked at that. Um, so we, of course, we have to control very carefully for this. And I, with zebra fish, because they have an indeterminate growth, um, actually a much better metric is fish size over fish age, just because the, the more a fish is fed, the bigger the fish, the faster it will age. So we, we control all of these things very carefully. Um, our fish facility staff does a fantastic job kind of helping us with all of this um, and, and you know, keep, keeping our fish happy and taking care of them. Um, so we personally haven't, you know, we haven't looked yet, but that is a project that we're actually getting really interested in is looking at if, you know, older fish actually regenerate better or worse. I do know work in the mouse has showed shown that there are differences in regenerative or, or at least functional capacity after injury depending on different ages. So I, I would suspect we'd probably see a very similar effect. Great. Okay. Thank you, Dan. Well, that was fantastic. Now, Gary, you can take it away. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Harini Ayer, and I'm a postdoc at Stanford University. And I'm delighted to introduce our next speaker, Joseph Campanelli, who is a, currently a postdoctoral fellow in Denise Montel's lab at the University of California in Santa Barbara. Joseph has a broad range of research experiences with many twists and turns that I particularly relate with because we share so many parallels in our training, although his training has been in far more gorgeous locations. Joseph obtained his bachelor's degree in biological sciences and microbiology, but for his graduate studies, he was drawn to study the purple sea urchin and obtained his PhD from the Hamdoun lab at the beautiful Scripps Institution of Oceanography at UCSD. As a postdoctoral fellow in the Montel lab, Joseph is investigating collective cell migration in Drosophila border cells. Joseph has been awarded multiple competitive fellowships and awards, including uh, the American Cancer Society Postdoctoral Fellowship. He was an honoree at the Santa Barbara chapter, American Cancer Society Annual Riviera Gala, and he was elected chair of the 2017 Gordon Research Seminar in Directed Cell Migration. Joseph has also received multiple recognitions for his absolutely gorgeous imaging and microscopy. And as someone who's taken a sneak peek at some of his images and movies, I assure you that you're all in for a treat. And with that brief introduction, I will hand this webinar over to Joseph. All right. Thank you, Harini, for that very, very kind introduction. As I go in to share my screen. All right. Um, so again, thank you, Harini, for the kind introduction. Thank you to SDB for giving me the opportunity to share some of my work. And thank you to all of you that are tuning in. Um, I want to tell you a story today that has to do with leaders and followers in a special group of cells that I've uh, come to know and love called the border cells that migrate collectively or as a group during Drosophila ovarian development. And so where I would like to begin is saying that collective cell migration is an essential cell behavior that cells use in order to perform development, including morphogenesis. It's a critical feature of wound healing, and it is one of the causative mechanisms by which groups of cells use um, during cancer metastasis. The formal definition for collective cell migration is, is when cells move together, and simultaneously affect the behavior of one another. And one critical feature of collective cells is that they come in various shapes and sizes and arrangements that include sheets, strands, clusters, and often is the case, although not always the case, they come with either a single or a couple leaders that is supported by a cast of followers represented in uh, orange and purple respectively. But live imaging has greatly excelled our ability to explore the molecular mechanisms that collective cells use uh, uh, across multiple species um, to move together and coordinate their cell behaviors. And I highlight three examples here that are some of my favorites, including the lateral line in zebrafish primordium, uh, branching morphogenesis in the mammary gland from Andrew Ewald's lab, and then also to highlight the fact that tumors invade collectively into the extracellular matrices and is often one of the foundation 
uh, founding mechanisms by which cancers spread. In the Montel lab, we um, uh, use the Drosophila ovary as a model to study border cell migration. Border cells are a cluster um, uh, uh, of migrating cells that arise at the very anterior end of this stage 9A chamber. And you'll see that they delaminate, they develop a single leader cell supported by a cast of five to, fo uh, five to seven follower cells as they move in between these giant nurse cells and they crawl uh, in between these cells to reach the anterior tip of the oocyte where they will then go on to form the micropile, an essential structure for um, entry of the sperm. This is a higher resolution view of the border cells showing explicitly that they have a single leader cell with a beautiful and dynamic uh, cellular protrusion, and they are supported by a cohesive set of follower cells. Those follower cells include other border cells and two non-migratory polar cells that are, uh, that are the initial recruiters of all of the border cells. So border cells pick them up and move them over to the border of the oocyte. Now, for a long time in the field, there was a dominant model that the motive force for migration of this entire cluster came solely from the leader cell and particularly from the leader cell's dynamic protrusion. And more recently, in, it, the model was is that this cluster moved forward in a grapple and pull style model where this leader cell would extend a protrusion that would act as a grapple and then contractive forces would then uh, 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 pull the cluster along. More recently, those models have um, um, been tested by our lab and um, show that they, our lab has gone on to show that that isn't entirely the case. And we have several uh, publications that I don't really have time to talk about, but I will at least tell you that the function of the leader cell isn't to passively pull along, or sorry, isn't to pull along passive follower cells, but leader cells rather sense chemoattractant gradients that guide them on their way. They steer this entire cluster down the center of the A chamber, and they open up very tight spaces between the nurse cells in which they migrate. And these, this conclusion has led us to now re-question if the leader cell isn't pulling the uh, cluster along, well, then what is? And so the uh, uh, one possibility is that the followers are actually the ones doing the migrating in, in this cluster and uh, produ uh, producing the modal force that the cluster needs in order to migrate. And so the first steps that we decided to take to look at this is first looking at high resolution imaging and seeing exactly the dynamics that these follower cells um, produce, which are not quite as dramatic as the uh, leader cells that many people have studied. And then secondly, um, to take some of the dynamics that we see and identify the molecular regulators and so I will first show you some of the first uh, movies that we started out with, where we've highlighted border cells uh, with a live actin marker in green, polar cell nuclei in red, and then the ECM that they detach from and delaminate from in purple. And what you can see from this movie is that there's a little bit of a competition for a leader border cell. Once that leader border cell is specified, the whole cluster rounds up and leaves. But what I hope you appreciate even more than just this leader cell protrusion is that these follower cells have many active dynamics and don't appear to be passive in this entire process. And these dynamics are not relegated to the initial detachment stages of the border cells, but rather you can see um, instances where follower cells uh, crawl to catch up to the rest of the cluster. And we uh, surmise that this is part of how the cluster stays cohesive, that follower cells might be actively migrating to retain cohesiveness. You can see when border cells switch leaders, which they don't necessarily uh, have to do, but sometimes do during their migration, um, that these follower cells um, produce these little rudder-like protrusions that we surmise help uh, turn the cluster. And then you can see as the cluster goes to dock, follower cells, uh, again, almost all of them form 
um, cellular protrusions that are distinct from the leader cells. And what this led us to um, investigate or question is what is what are the molecular pathways controlling some of these follower cell behaviors, and are they independent from those that are in the leader cell? And on, uh, we ended up being inspired by some of the molecules that are active to generate that lead cell protrusion and in, investigate uh, RAC, the essential rho GTPase RAC that is known to be active and required for all known uh, cell migrations. Um, and the reason why we looked at this is for many years, we've had a RAC activity reporter, and this is a FRET-based sensor reporter. And you can see we've known for a long time that RAC is about 15% higher in lead cell protrusions than it is in the rest of the cell, but it's only 15% higher here. And there is RAC, active RAC in the follower cells. And this set up a question if the molecular features for the activation of RAC downstream of receptor tyrosine kinase signaling that activate a series of GEFs um, that converge on the activity of Rho are um, exclusively relegated to the lead cell, is there a uh, fundamental um, requirement for RAC activity in the follower cells? Uh, it, it's a little bit hard to study RAC activity when uh, when we knock down whole cluster or when we use whole cluster knockdowns of RAC activity by overexpressing a RAC dominant negative. It turns out that you impede either the production of leaders and followers. So this is not necessarily a, a very uh, uh, fruitful way to study RAC. So in order to get around this problem, we devised an experiment where we could create mosaic clones that genetically manipulate the amount and activity of RAC and at the same time simultaneously mark only a few cells in the cluster. And so this is what this experiment kind of looks like. We made single cell or very small cl uh, uh, clones of cells expressing the actin marker Moise and GFP so that we could monitor cell shape and cell actin dynamics, along with constructs that affect RAC activity, including RAC dominant negative or con control constructs that don't. And we did this in single or very small cells to evaluate their effect on morphology. And we found a very surprising result that follower cells exhibit actin dynamics that precede their crawling. And I wanna orient you here to a forming border cell cluster that you've already, um, uh, similar to what you've already seen that is in the process of delaminating and it's rounded up. You can see two clonal cells here, one of which is a leader cell and one of which is a follower cell. And they are, uh, they are um, on opposite sides of these dark areas. And that is unmarked clonal, or sorry, unmarked cells that um, are not expressing either any uh, control construct or Moise and GFP. And if I play this movie, I hope you will begin to appreciate that follower cells are not passive in this entire process and that they are quite dynamic. And if I blow this up a little bit more, you can see that that follower cell is crawling on top of an unlabeled follower cell in order to make contact with the, um, with the leader cell right here. And this set up a hypothesis that um, part of cluster cohesion and cluster movement is dictated not only in part from the sensory that the leader cell, the, the sensory protrusion that the leader cell generates, but also the crawling, the cell on cell crawling that follower cells exhibit. And so um, just to show you that this is an in fact um, completely dependent on RAC activity. We can compare and contrast clones that uh, control cells and those of RAC dominant negative. And in controls, we can see that cells are uh, tightly bound and cohesive to the rest of the non-clonal cells in the group. And that when we expressed RAC dominant negative in a single cell of the cluster, it not only lags behind the entire cluster, but there's a loss of cohesiveness in that it, uh, its cell body falls behind. So this cell is literally being dragged through the rest of the egg chamber by all the rest of the wild type cells in the, in the cluster. 
So to provide additional evidence on whether follower cells require RAC activity, we decided to keep going with our mosaic analysis. And in this analysis, we measured migration index or the amount of clusters, the percentage of clusters that made it to the border of the oocyte with increasing numbers of clonal cells inside of the cluster, blue representing complete migration and orange representing incomplete migration. And what you'll appreciate is that no matter how many clonal cells up to four, why are control clones always make it to the border of the oocyte by stage 10? where this is in contrast to RAC dominant negative um, clones where increasing the number of clonal cells in the cluster severely impedes the amount of cells that uh, are the amount of clusters that make it to the border of the oocyte. And I will hope that you appreciate that even a single follower cell that doesn't have RAC activity is sufficient to impede migration of the border cell cluster. And what this led us to conclude is that follower cells do in fact crawl. They are dynamic and not passive in the process of border cell migration. And that part of this crawling behavior depends on RAC activity to promote both cluster cohesion and overall successful cluster migration. So this led us to ask what is the regulator of RAC specifically in the follower cells? And I didn't show you the data, but we can show that this RAC activity in the follower cells is completely independent of the chemoattractant signal in the leader cells, because if we make similar clones of the RT, uh, uh, knockdown for RTK signaling, we see no defect in overall migration. So the goal then was to identify what regulators might be active specifically in follower cells so that we can start to reconstruct how follower cells are actually moving and crawling on one another. And to do this, we took advantage of genetic screens, which are um, easy, relatively easy to do in Drosophila. And we decided to screen all of the GEFs and the GAFs gaps available in the Drosophila genome to specifically look for those that are regulating a follower cell pool of RAC. And the reason why we took the approach to look for GEFs or guanine exchange factors is guanine exchange factors exchange GDP, that is um, uh, uh, um, uh, a marker of inactive rho GTPases, whether it be RAC, rho, or CDC42, for GTP. So GEFs activate rho GTPases, and their counterparts, GAPs, um, uh, uh, inactivate them. So the question was, can we find a GEF that when knocked down prevents follower cells from crawling? Working together with a colleague in the lab, Jim Mondo, who actually did the screen, we hit a, bear, a bit of serendipity. Yes, we found a rho GTPase regulator that shared phenotypes with RAC knockdown. And that, G, that rho, uh, uh, rho GTPase GEF is called CDEP. And here you can see a full border cell uh, uh, knockdown, and I'll replay this movie, where these clusters lose cohesiveness as they migrate. And uh, one way we can measure this is looking at cluster aspect ratio, the length, their anterior posterior length uh, <clears throat> during migration. And you can see that in wild type cells or control RNAIs, clusters are very compact. And when we use two independent RNAIs for CDEP across the whole cluster, we can expand the anterior posterior aspect ratio of this cluster as it loses cohes uh, cohesiveness. And this showed us that CDEP knockdown caused the clusters to lose cohesion and elongate like RAC knockdown. Now, I said CDEP is a, a, a GEF for rho GTPases, and we were interested to identify whether it was a RAC CDC42 or rho GEF. And I will tell you that it was a RAC GEF. And some of the evidence that we have for this is that when we measure normalized RAC FRET activity using our FRET reporter and two independent CDEP RNAi lines compared to two independent control lines, we saw a 20% overall reduction in uh, RAC activity. And I'm not showing you the data, but we ruled out that it was specific for Rho or CDC42. So CDEP is specifically an activator of RAC. What was even more interesting is that if we mapped that RAC activity using our FRET reporter 
we saw no difference in the front back bias of that rack activity. So leader cells were perfectly uh, able to form a lead cell protrusion and the bias in front back rack activity, that 15% bias still existed, but there was an overall depression in rack activity. And that was specifically from CDEP in the follower cells. So here we've identified that CDEP is the first rack gap that acts outside of the lead cell protrusion specifically. So then we wondered, well, where is CDEP actually located within the follower cells? We tagged CDEP endogenously uh, with a GFP and localized it to basal lateral membranes, not in lead cell protrusions, fitting with the idea that CDEP is specific to follower cells and controlling rack activity and follower cell crawling. The, <clears throat> from this GFP, you can see that CDEP is basal in the whole uh, egg chamber, and it has some lateral membrane localization. And if we zoom in, you can see it is absent from the lead cell protrusion, and it marks lateral and basal membranes in this delaminating border cell. It is very concentrated between each one of the border cells and the polar cells, and it is um, uh, least concentrated where the border cells contact the nurse cells. And border cells do retain apical basal polarity as they migrate, as indicated here by APKC, the apical membrane, and you can see CDEP is exclusively on basal lateral surfaces. From this, we were able to conclude that CDEP knockdown causes the loss of follower cell crawling and cohesion while retaining lead cell protrusions. And this is likely from uh, regulating a specific basal pool of racks specifically in follower cells. So then we turned our attention to asking, well, it, CDEP is basal and CDEP is regulating a basal pool of racks specifically in follower cells. What is regulating CDEP? And we turned our attention to classical proteins that regulate apical basal polarity. As I told you, border cells retain this during their migratory uh, period. One minute. APKC is an apical determinant and scribble is a basal determinant. And scribble um, uh, marks the basal lateral membrane and uh, scaffolds hundreds of proteins, including many rack gaps. So we asked the question, could Scribble be regulating follower cell migration and polarity uh, by scaffolding CDAP? We then used RNAi approaches to show that yes, Scribble is required. And when we knocked it down, clusters were less cohesive, followers ectopically protruded and cells fell off the cluster. And in our live imaging experiments, it recapitulated the CDAP and RAC knockdown where clusters elongated over time. There we concluded that scribble is required for cluster cohesion and its loss converts cells into leader-like cells of the cluster. So now CDEP and scribble give similar uh, phenotypic knockdowns. We decided to ask the question if, uh, uh, if scribble is localizing CDEP and to do this, we knocked Scribble down along with a variety of uh, polarity regulators. And then we monitored the amount of CDEP on basal to apical surfaces. And from these traces in a variety of knockdowns for uh, uh, different polarity regulators, we were able to measure the asymmetry of CDEP and show that it's specific to Scribble. So polarity pl proteins, including APKC and Scribble, regulate CDEP localization. And in the last experiment that I want to show you is that now I've connected Scribble and CDEP and RAC, but we wanted to see if we could rescue some of these um, uh, phenotypic effects that we observed. So Scribble regulates CDEP localization and CDEP uh, regulates RAC. In the loss of scribble, CDEP comes off the membrane as I just showed you. So we asked the question, can relocalization of CDEP to basal lateral membranes rescue some aspects of scribble um, phenotype? To do this, we turn to a, a construct from Marcus Affrolter's lab called GRAB-FP, um, which is uh, a GFP nanobody tagged with a basal lateral transmembrane protein that would relocalize CDEP to the membrane in the loss of, after the loss of scribble. And this is in contrast to a control nanobody experiment. What we found is that localizing CDEP GFP after scribble knockdown partially rescues the cohesion defect. 
So if we measure cluster aspect ratio in wild type, you can see they're nice and tight. And when we knock scribble down, they're not so tight and the cluster uh, is less cohesive. When we bring CDEP back to the membrane and restore some of the follicle cell, uh, follower cell migration, we can rescue some of uh, that migration defect. So today I showed you that only with live imaging could we determine that polarity regulated GEF activity specifically in follower cells um, uh, downstream of RAC controls follower cell behavior. And our working model now is that there are two independent functions of RAC, one in the leader cell to generate a sensory protrusion and another polarity regulated um, uh, spatial pool of RAC specifically in follower cells that uh, contributes to um, border cell migration. And we have a variety of follow-up questions here about the additional uh, uh, roles of scribble and collectives. The phenotypes are much more dramatic, whether the uh, similar um, uh, polarity pathways control RAC in vertebrate cells and do similar leader and follower dynamics, um, are, are they at play in sheet and strand migration? So with that, I would like to thank you for your attention and acknowledge the entire Denise Montel lab, including many of my uh, co-authors and collaborators, Jim Mondo, Abhinava Mishra, Wai Dai, and Sharon Guo. I would like to thank Jocelyn McDonald, David Builder, and Chris, Lo uh, Chris Doe for um, critical reagents that, uh, for this project, and then funding from the American Cancer Society, the National Institutes of Health, and UCSB for, for this work. Thank you so much for that gorgeous talk, Joseph. And I am a huge fan of live imaging as a zebrafish person. So I love to see videos in other organisms and your videos are absolutely gorgeous. So the first question we have, which is one that I had also is from Malika who asks, who first says beautiful videos. Uh, I'm sure everyone shares that feeling. Uh, so your data suggests that RAC activity is independently regulated in leader and follower cells. And so what determines which cells are leaders and which are followers and also you showed that sometimes they swap right so when they switch positions then like how does the rack activity regulation change between the leaders and the followers this is a really good question um so i think i should start out by saying that border cells often exchange leaders um although that's not required. There are many instances where we do live imaging and they never exchange a leader. And there are some instances where they may change a leader four or five times during their migration. That's a really good question. We don't understand how this pathway may be regulated or um, I think a better way of maybe um, proposing this is how the leader cell signaling is um, interacting with the polarity cell signaling that's controlling follower cell behavior. We don't know how that exists. We do know that knockdown of CDEP in the entire cluster doesn't destroy a leader cell ability to be a leader cell when it doesn't interfere with the amount of RAC that leader cells have. So we think that they're independent, although there has to be some kind of crosstalk so that the entire cl cluster knows that there's a single leader and that, that follower cells don't uh, try to become leaders. Now, a piece of evidence that we have that um, um, that, that uh, happens via mechanotransduction, that leader cells tug on their follower cells, and that part of the physical coupling through adherence junctions, and it's an ecadherin-mediated process, that uh, followers know that they're followers because they're being tugged on by the leader. So that's one way in which that happens. That, that's great. Um, we have a lot of interesting questions for you. I'm just going to go in the sequence in which they were asked, but I've taken a screenshot of the questions and we will just have you answer them offline. So the next question is, uh, first, Claire, Claire Thomas says, nice talk, Joseph. And you mentioned that border cells move uh, between tightly associated nurse cells. So is the nurse cell contact a function of cell cell adhesion or cell ECM cell? And I'm curious if there is a role for border cell secreted um, so actually border cells are a fascinating group of cells that migrate without an ECM. It is an ecadherin mediated adhesion and nurse cells require ecadherin to keep them, the, the two nurse cells tightly abutted to one another. And then 
um, EK adherent is required not only in the nurse cells, but in the border cells for the migration. So it turns out that if you knock down EK adherent in nurse cells, border cells have no traction and can't migrate. And if you knock down EK adherent in border cells, they um, again have no traction to migrate. So this there is no cell ECM or um, that we can detect. And believe me, we've tried. And um, although we haven't looked for secreted proteases, uh, in part because we don't find any ECM, we can attribute um, a lot of uh, border cell migration defects to losses in E. cadherin, which is the surface molecule that they use for traction. We'll, we'll answer one more question and perhaps sure. we can take Lewis's question offline. So Michelle uh, says, hi, great images videos. Uh, how early do you see the CDEP expression in presumptive border cells at the interior? For example, is it higher in to be follower cells early on? I think this goes back to the original question of like, what makes a leader cell a leader cell and what makes a follower cell a follower and whether C dep when and how, yeah, is it uh, determining? C dep is there throughout the entire development of the egg chamber and it localizes to the basal lateral surface of the entire egg chamber through ovarial development. So um, although it's slightly relocalized in border cells as they migrate and develop a slightly odd um, apical basal polarity, it um, seems to be there in all follicle cells um, during the entirety of uh, follicle cell development. And so this leads us to the question, that is it controlling a spatial pool of RAC in, in other types of uh, morphogenetic movements, particularly during um, Drosophila ovary development um, in follower cells in those instances? Great question. Uh, I'm, I have uh, Lewis's and Richard's questions like stored away and perhaps you can get back to them uh, course, after the talk. Uh, sorry, you. we couldn't get to all the questions. Every, both the speakers had so many amazing questions because of the great talks. Um, and I want to just thank all of you for being here. Thank you, Dana and Joseph for your beautiful talks. And this seminar has been recorded and it will be uh, available on SDB's website next week. Uh, please join us for next month's seminar on Friday, February 10, when Daniel Medina Cano from Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center and GA Lee from the University of Washington will present. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>